Alright, so the release date of Shin Megami Tensei 5 might have leaked before Nintendo's E3 Direct, by Atlas of all things, but that still didn't prepare fans for what the game had in store. The gameplay and story setup seems like enough to really get the fanbase excited, and I'm intrigued too as I've barely touched the main series and have stuck mostly to Persona, but that could change with 5's release. Maybe this could be the breakout. So if you're looking for more details, then I've got you covered as my good friend Catherine is a massive fan of the series and she really wanted to deep dive into the reveal herself. And I thought it was a great idea, though I do ask that you forgive her mic quality as she's not exactly a professional YouTuber. But with that in mind, let me throw it over to her so she can break down all the latest info on Shimagami Tensei 5. Thanks Derek. Let's start with a little primer on the Shimagami Tensei series. Shin Megami Tensei, or SMT, is a series of RPGs that debuted on the Super Famicom in 1992. There have been four numbered games in the core SMT series, generally referred to as mainline SMT. Multiple sub-series, such as the Devil Summoner games and the very well-known Persona series, have spun off the mainline series, each with their own unique style. The last mainline game to be released was SMT4 Apocalypse, a direct sequel to SMT4, in 2016. While many aspects of the gameplay have changed over the years, there are a few key attributes always present in the mainline SMT games. First, the games take place in Tokyo, during and after an influx of demons. Second, there is some sort of cataclysmic event that strikes Tokyo, leaving the city in an apocalyptic state. Third, the protagonist is able to recruit demons to fight alongside him, and he can fuse these demons together to create even more powerful demons. Finally, and arguably most importantly, there is a central ideological conflict between law and chaos. In SMT, the law faction strives for a world of order, control, and obedience to authority. The forces of law are generally led by the Judeo-Christian god, yod heh vod -Heh, or YHVH, and his angels. On the other hand, the chaos faction believes in survival of the fittest and desires a world of freedom, where might equals right. The forces of chaos are generally led by Lucifer, the fallen angel. There's also a third neutral option, where the player rejects both law and chaos, instead trying to strike a balance between the two. While many players consider the neutral option to be the best one, it's important to note that this is not always the case. In the SMT timeline, choosing the neutral path tends to merely delay the conflict between law and chaos for another generation to deal with. Every mainline SMT game has multiple endings, depending on which faction the player chooses to side with. The deep questions of morality and how the player views the world can lead to very polarizing opinions on law versus chaos, and the alignment system is a core part of the mainline series. Before I dive into the trailers, I want to stress that I am covering everything that has come out since the Direct. And while the English and Japanese trailers have a lot of overlap, there are some major differences, so this analysis will cover content from both trailers, as well as some content from the Nintendo of America livestream and the Japanese livestream. This also includes the recent gameplay trailer, though that's really just the Japanese trailer in English. Additionally, Atlas has been posting a daily demon showcase, which I strongly recommend checking out if you want to see more of the new and returning demons. The Japanese trailer begins with narration stating that the god of law has been at war with other gods for ages, while showing the intensity of that war and its various players. The first demons shown are the angels Principality and Power, who we see fighting Kaiwan and Baphomet. There's a quick shot of two more recurring demons, Ishtar and Ariok. We then see two new demon designs, who were identified in Atlas's Daily Demon Showcase. The golden mask creature with wings is in fact the series staple Angel, sporting a serious redesign. The other creature, who uses a pitchfork, has been identified as Daimon, a new demon for this game. This opening sequence ends with a close-up on another, decidedly more horrific demon, whose identity is unclear. However, it seems to play a major role in the game, as its thick black tentacles are noticeably similar to the one shown in the background of the SMT5 box art. The Japanese trailer transitions to a shot of a Tokyo subway station, and this is where the English direct trailer begins. The protagonist, who's been lovingly dubbed Vikun by many fans, is wearing a gakuran, a type of Japanese school uniform, with an elaborate pattern of white lilies on it. That detail is likely purposeful, as white lilies symbolize purity and virginity in flower language. However, white lilies, particularly stargazer lilies, are also a common funeral flower, as they symbolize the soul of the deceased being restored to innocence. Considering the events we see happening to Vikun later in the trailer, the symbolism present is apt, to say the least. Continuing on, the protagonist's school is shown to be Jolin Academy, with the kanji in the school's name meaning rope and stamp or seal. 
Even the buttons on V's Gakuran have the kanji for rope on them. Additionally, the emblem on the school seen in the English trailer is a gecko overlaid on a pentagram. The gecko is often a symbol of rebirth, due to this animal's ability to shed its skin and even regrow its tail. Combined with the white lilies on the school uniform, there's a lot of symbolism pertaining to death and rebirth. Both trailers show the protagonist walking beneath an underpass, then falling to the ground as the environment starts shaking. Despite showing the same scene, the voiceovers for the two versions of the trailer paint very different pictures of the setting. In English, the voiceover says that the protagonist is being pulled into a different dimension. However, in Japanese, a female sounding voice says, if I told you that the Tokyo we've been living in was actually a lie, would you believe me? The English version implies that the protagonist is pulled from Tokyo to an alternate dimension where the cataclysm has occurred, while the Japanese version states that the normal seeming Tokyo was an illusion and the devastated city is the reality. Given that the Japanese trailer appears to use actual dialogue from the game, it is more likely the accurate take on the situation. This dual reality setup has similarities to the beginning of SMT4, where the protagonists are oblivious to the existence of a post-apocalyptic Tokyo right under the peaceful kingdom. However, in the trailer, we see Vikun collapse under an underpass, then wake up and walk out from what appears to be the same underpass in the devastated Tokyo. This makes me think that the two versions of Tokyo are, in fact, the same place, but the protagonist was living in a false reality. We then see the protagonist in the true Tokyo, a cityscape full of crumbling buildings, odd spires, and sand everywhere. This desert wasteland is called Dot, a term that has roots in real-world religion. The Dot stands at the center of the Sephirot, which is a way of categorizing and understanding God in Kabbalah. Each of the Sephirot represents an attribute of God, such as wisdom or beauty, and Dot represents the unity of the other ten. In some depictions of the Sephirot, Dot isn't labeled, it's just a space where the other Sephirot intersect. Interestingly, this isn't the first time the Sephirot have been mentioned in the history of SMT. In SMT 3, the 11 menorah that the demi fiend is tasked to collect are named after the Sephirot, including Da. This isn't the only parallel between SMT 3 and what we've seen of SMT 5, though. As an aside, Da is the third time that a desert version of Tokyo has featured heavily in mainline SMT. The first is the Vortex world in SMT 3, and the second is Blasted Tokyo in SMT 4. Both the Vortex World and Blasted Tokyo were caused by their game's respective law representatives. However, in a previous SMT5 trailer, we saw Lucifer floating over Dot, proclaiming that the god you worship is dead. This suggests that the forces of chaos might be responsible for the devastation of Tokyo, or it may have been a result of the battle between law and chaos. Returning to the trailer, a number of daemon are destroyed by a blast of light, and a mysterious man descends. His name has been revealed to be Aogami, which roughly translates to Blue Deity. The metallic nature of Aogami's appearance has some interesting implications regarding his origin and motives. Many high-ranking angels in SMT, such as Metatron, Sandalphon, and Cherub, have a metallic appearance, symbolizing their unfailing, almost robotic devotion to the side of law. This outfit doesn't guarantee that Aogami is an angel or otherwise affiliated with law or YHVH, but it does beg the question, what side of the conflict is he on? Algami tells the protagonist, if you don't wish to die, take my hand, and the two merge into one being, the Nahobino. The name Nahobino comes from Shinto, and refers to two gods born from Izanagi. The duty of these gods is to fix the blight brought by the gods of calamity, Magatsuhi. Unsurprisingly, this suggests that the Nahobino in SMT5 has been brought forth to fix the current state of the world. The protagonist's transformation into the Nahobino has parallels to the SMT3 protagonist's transformation into the Demi Fiend. In both cases, the physical appearance of the protagonist is dramatically changed, and they gain the ability to fight and recruit demons. The Demi Fiend's transformation was caused by Lucifer, who is generally the leader of the forces of chaos. However, unlike Aogami, Lucifer doesn't fuse with the SMT3 protagonist. Once the SMT5 protagonist fuses with Aogami, they become one being, and if the Nahubino is killed in battle, the protagonist's human form and Algami briefly appear before they both fade away, returning to the Tree of Knowledge. The Nahubino is then shown traversing the overworld, showcasing his greater mobility. He slides down sand slopes, dashes, and jumps over objects in the environment. It makes traversal much more dynamic and engaging than we've ever seen. And this extends to the enemies as, in a first for the series, they're now visible in the overworld in their demon forms. 
We also see that the demons can spot the Nahobino and will move to engage him, as demonstrated by Slime, Onmoraki, and Suchigumo. It's worth noting that all the demons appear to be sized appropriately, as Suchigumo, Jatayu, and Bishamonten are all significantly larger than demons like Slime and Onmoraki. Plus, in the Japanese trailer, a new and unexpected feature was revealed. A demon can follow the protagonist on the overworld. A few demons are shown to follow the Nahobino in the trailer. The new demon, Amanozako, series staple Jack-o'-lantern, and Dekarabia. The question is, will this be available to all demons, or are there some limitations? Because look, I have to know if Mara can follow you around. Pulling out of that, the game doesn't seem to be limited to Sandy City Ruin environments. There's a rocky area with dead trees, and some buildings with strange glowing formations bursting through the ground. In a couple instances, an odd glowing dodecahedron is visible in the background, although it's unclear what its function actually is. Beyond these locations, the treehouse showed off some interactable elements in the overworld. This includes glowing patches that restore HP, MP, and a new battle mechanic, Magatsuhi, which I'll cover more of when going over the battle footage. He can also raid vending machines, which have somehow survived the apocalypse. The final environmental element worth noting is the return of the moon phase, after being absent in both SMT4 and Apocalypse, though the moon phase made a cosmetic appearance in the latter. In earlier SMT games, the moon phase had a variety of effects on gameplay, such as increasing or decreasing damage dealt, altering the demon's responses and negotiations, and affecting the outcome of demon fusion. Future gameplay footage should hopefully reveal more about how the moon phase works in SMT5. But what about the battle system? The Treehouse demo provided a lengthy look into how fights play out. To start off, we can see that the press turn system from SMT3 and 4 returns. The system is similar to the one found in Persona, as it grants the player an extra action, or half press turn, in battle if they strike an enemy's elemental weakness or get a critical hit. Unlike Persona's system, however, if the attack is nullified or dodged, the player will lose press turns. You need to be careful though, as it works both ways, meaning the enemy is infected by these outcomes. That said, there is one really cute touch, as the press turn icon for the opponent is the original demon sprite from the first SMT. The standard battle actions are present in the menu, and, as in previous titles, demons appear to be unable to talk or use items, at least by default. Intriguingly, physical skills such as Aramasa appear to use MP rather than HP to power them, a notable difference from the Persona games and something implemented in SMT4. The Nahobino has two skills labeled Omagatoki, critical, that lists Magatsuhi as a cost instead of MP. Magatsuhi was first introduced in SMT3. It is a form of energy that comes from human emotions and powers demons. While Magatsuhi was simply a story element there, it is clearly a battle mechanic of some sort in SMT5. Above the party info, we see a Magatsuhi meter that is currently at max. Footage from the Japanese trailer also shows that some demons have specific skills powered by Magatsuhi, so this is not limited to the Nahobino. But how is this any different from the other skills that can be used? Are they more powerful in some way? Or is it more of an emergency backup in case things go badly? There's no way to know for sure until we see more. As in SMT4, demons with a weakness to a certain skill are highlighted with an exclamation point in the menu, and their entire elemental weakness and resistance spectrum is displayed when they are targeted. However, these are not known right away. As a standard for the series, elemental weaknesses and resistances are hidden until they are hit with their respective elements, or, presumably, recruited into the party. SMT5 has the standard elements of physical, fire, ice, force, lightning, light, and dark. Although sadly it looks as if the gun element from SMT4 is not returning. An interesting addition to the battle UI is that we sometimes get to see an enemy's current HP. It's not always present though, implying something needs to be done in order to see what each demon's health is at. Maybe defeating, recruiting, or fusing demons reveals their HP? Another convenient UI addition is the unregistered demon marker above demons, as we see with the mandrake here. This will certainly be helpful for anyone going for 100% completion of the compendium. As far as recruitment goes, demon negotiation seems essentially unchanged from previous entries. They still demand money and items and ask questions. Figuring out the best way to recruit specific demons is part of the series' appeal, as the demons don't always respond in the way you expect. For example, sometimes they prefer to have their offers rejected saying it's no fun when it's too easy. We see the level up screen after Onmoraki levels up, and there's a few surprises here as well. While the left side displays the usual information, including the demon's stats, experience needed for the next level up, and its elemental weaknesses, there's something new on the top right. 
Above the list of skills is a field labeled Skill Potential, with counters for each of the main elements as well as Almighty, Status Effects, Healing, and Support skills. In the case of Anmaraki here, Fire has plus 2, Ice has minus 3, and Dark has plus 1. In the skill list, Amaraki's Agi is listed as Agi plus 2, and the next skills section shows that he is going to learn Mudo plus 1. This looks to be similar to the skill affinity system that debuted in SMT4 Apocalypse. Demons have innate affiliations for certain elements, often based on their mythology, such as Jack Frost being strong against ice and weak against fire. The skill affinity reflects the demon's particular strengths and weaknesses by assigning a plus or minus modifier to skills of the corresponding elements. In the trailer's example, Omaraki is a demon associated with fire, so his fire skills have higher potential and will be innately stronger. Conversely, Omaraki is weak to ice, so if he gained an ice skill via fusion, that ice skill will be weaker. The skill potential system is designed to differentiate demon's offensive capabilities and encourage careful fusion to align inherited skills with the demon's skill potential, rather than piling a bunch of high-level elemental skills on a single demon with a strong magic stat. Players will actually have to consider a bit more about what they'll be fusing and their potential. The Nahobino's level screen was also shown in the treehouse footage. Here, he has no skill potentials. However, the fact that the skill potential field is present on his level up screen makes me wonder if his skill potentials can change. In both SMT4 and SMT4 Apocalypse, the protagonist was able to obtain and strengthen skills via a Whisper event, in which a demon which had learned all other skills could teach those skills to the protagonist. We'll have to see if the Demon Whisper system will return, or if the Nahobino will have a different mechanism for learning skills. Every piece of media so far has shown footage of the Cathedral of Shadow, where demons gather for fusion. But it looks like the series staple minister of the room, Mito, has been replaced in favor of a girl named Sophia. <sighs> I'll miss him. Sophia's not the only new thing here, though, as the Nahobino seems to play an odd keyboard during demon fusion, for some reason. He really gets into it, too. But in addition to the normal 2 demon fusion, special fusion with 3 demons looks to be returning. Baal, Abaddon, and an unknown third demon are fused to create Beelzebub, who is a special fusion in both SMT4 and SMT4 Apocalypse. I've named quite a few demons so far, but the battle footage in both trailer highlights even more. The blonde demon with horns is Finn Makul, a hunter warrior from Eilish mythology and a newcomer to SMT. He's seen using a skill called Maka Nruin plus 5, named after Finn's sword. Then there's the return of Mermaid, using a skill called Stormcaller's Song plus 3. Mermaid has only appeared in SMT4 Apocalypse and the very obscure Demikids games. If you haven't heard of Demikids, look it up. It's basically Pokemon featuring SMT demons. Next up is a quadruped wolf-like demon, who is shown using a healing skill, Sun's Radiance plus 3. I'm not sure who this demon is, but my best guess is that it's an updated version of Fenrir. Fenrir hasn't been in a 3D game since SMT Devil Summoner 2, where his 3D model was pretty simple. But this demon has similarities to these older models of Fenrir, as well as the more recent 2D sprites used in SMT4 and SMT4 Apocalypse. Whoever this demon is, he appears important to the game, as he is pictured on the box art as well. From the battle footage we've seen here, as well as the Daily Demon Showcase, it appears that many of the demons in SMT5 have unique attacks. Certain demons have had exclusive skills before, such as Alice Wirt her infamous Die For Me skill. But it's looking like these unique skills will be much more common in SMT5. The battle footage ends with the Nahobino using a dramatic attack called Wrath Tempest, likely a skill unique to him. Before we wrap up, there are a couple of additional aspects only seen in the Japanese footage that I'd like to cover. First, a shop can be seen which sells healing and battle items. Like in SMT4, there's an inventory cap that differs for each item, with the cap being lower for more powerful items like beads or soma. The shop is run by an unidentified demon. The demon shopkeeper has a slight resemblance to the shopkeeper from Rags Jewelry, a recurring store in the series. However, Rags Jewelry only accepts gems in exchange for items or certain demons. This unknown demon is selling items for money, so it's likely completely new. But that highlights another notable aspect, because there's something missing from all the footage so far. Humans! Not a single one has been shown in Dot. That said, I'd be surprised if there were no other humans present in the game. To my knowledge, SMT3 has the fewest human NPCs of any of the mainline games. There are a number of ghosts and mannequins that provide flavor text and flesh out the world, but only a handful of living humans appear, most of whom are complete jerks. If SMT5 does take place after SMT3, the lack of humans would make sense. 
However, I'm curious to see who the Law and Chaos friends are in this game. Mainline SMT games typically have two companions who align with Law and Chaos, respectively. Their connection to the player and their perspectives on the ideological conflict can influence the player's decisions. SMT4's box art displays that game's Law and Chaos friends, Jonathan and Walter, very prominently. On SMT5's box art, we only see a handful of demons, no humans in sight. Could this mean that these demons are going to take the role of the Law and Chaos friends? That could be an interesting new take on things. Moving on, an additional cutscene is shown in the Japanese trailer, featuring a temple in flames. Power, Oni, and Angel are lying motionless on the ground, and a barefoot figure with a red garment appears to be climbing a set of stairs. This might be the same female demon in red seen on the box art. She seems to be a new demon, and her identity and role aren't currently known. However, she does seem likely to be chaos aligned, as they do tend to enjoy setting things on fire. The Nahobino then walks forward and is clearly shown summoning his blade from his right hand. Given that his weapon isn't independent of his body, it seems possible that SMT5, like SMT3, will not have a standard equipment system. In SMT3, there were no armor or weapons for the Demi Fiend, as you literally just punched everything. As a replacement, the Demi Fiend could ingest an item called a Magatama to equip it. Each Magatama would modify your stats and elemental weaknesses or resistances in a specific way. So it was possible, for example, to make the Demi Fiend immune to fire but weak to ice. The Magatama also served as the method of learning new skills in SMT3. In contrast, SMT 1, 2, and 4 had more typical equipment systems, where you buy and equip armor and weapons to increase your stats and modify resistances. Given the many parallels between the Demi Fiend and the Nahobino, I wouldn't be surprised if an equipment system closer to SMT 3's is present in SMT 5. The Japanese trailer ends with a shot of a large tree, whose leaves almost appear to be made out of Magatsuhi. This tree has been identified as the Tree of Knowledge thanks, funnily enough, to what the Japanese Special Edition is called. The tree in Judeo-Christian religions is found in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve first live, which ties into the English Special Edition's title, The Fall of Man. It also features in the game over screen, after the protagonist and Algami fade away. This prominence strongly suggests it's an important element in the story, though in what way, I don't really know yet. Looking over everything Atlas has revealed so far, there are some obvious parallels between SMT3 and SMT5, such as the transformation of the protagonist into the Nahobino and the desert landscape of Tokyo. However, it is possible that SMT5 has more than a superficial connection to SMT3. In a line of dialogue shown in the Treehouse livestream, the demon Agathion says that a great battle between angels and demons occurred 18 years ago, but Agathion isn't sure which side won. 18 is an oddly specific number, but SMT3 was released in Japan 18 years ago, in 2003. Is it possible that SMT5 takes place 18 years after the events of SMT3, either after one of that game's endings or in a different ending entirely? This would not be the first time that a mainline SMT title directly connected to another one. SMT2 takes place many years after the neutral ending in SMT1, and the side game SMT If is literally a what if story, where the cataclysm in SMT1 never happened. More recently, SMT4 Apocalypse branches off from SMT4's story and provides a different take on its ending. So the idea of SMT5 taking place after or in an alternate timeline from SMT3 isn't without precedence in the series. This begs the question, how would SMT5 follow from SMT3? One strong possibility is that SMT5 takes place after the true demon ending. Naturally, I want to give a spoiler warning since that game was just re-released. Skip ahead to this time if you'd rather not know. Alright? So, in this ending, the Demi Fiend forsakes his humanity and sides with Lucifer. The Demi Fiend becomes Lucifer's general, and with an army of demons, they set out to fight their true enemy implied to be YHVH. This would connect well with the previous trailer, where Lucifer proclaimed that God was dead. If SMT5 does take place 18 years after the true demon ending, then the devastated desert appearance of Tokyo would fit, as well as the dearth of humans. The state of the world is the result of the Demi Fiend's actions, and the Nahobino has been brought from an illusory Tokyo into the true one to fix the calamity our previous protagonist wrought. A sequel to SMT3 would be a really exciting premise for the next SMT game, and could be why SMT3 was recently re-released. It also raises so many questions. Did Lucifer and the Demi Fiend actually kill YHVH? Where is the Demi Fiend now? 
Who created the fake Tokyo that Vikun was living in? And for what purpose? And what is Aogami's role in all this? I'm really looking forward to seeing where this story goes. It's been a long time since that initial SMT5 trailer dropped in 2017, but the recent footage was well worth the wait. SMT5 looks gorgeous, a huge upgrade for the series in terms of presentation. The overworld looks much more vibrant, and it's a treat to see demons roaming around the environment. And while the music has been obscured in the trailers, what I've heard has that perfect SMT feel. A mixture of haunting simplicity for the quieter moments and dark, intense synth for the battles. There's a lot of exciting potential for the story from what we know and what we can speculate. And there's more footage to come, as Atlas Japan is still releasing daily videos showcasing new and returning demons. If you've been curious about the mainline SMT series or are looking for a unique and challenging RPG experience, I think SMT5 is shaping up to be an excellent starting place for newcomers. But what are your thoughts on Shin Megami Tensei 5? Do you have any theories of your own? Or will this be your first SMT game? Let us know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this deep dive into the gameplay trailers, please consider supporting Good Vibes Gaming on Patreon at patreon.com slash gvgaming so more videos like this can be created in the future. Of course, we appreciate all your support, whether it's just hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, or ringing the bell. If you'd like to hear more of me, I can be found on Twitter at Dr. Catherine. A huge thank you to Derek for allowing me to dive into SMT5 for Goodbyes Gaming and for all his help editing this project. Until next time, bye!